with me and uh, may God help us as we learn today. Uh, before we proceed, I want to share the link to some of my followers, in case of who might be interested to join. So this live stream is uh, free for all. And remember to ask your questions where necessary. And what we'll be discussing today, I said uh, metals and their compounds, of course. Okay, you're welcome back. So today I said we'll be discussing metals and their uh, compounds, of course. And uh, first, we need to know the definition of metals. So what is a metal? There is there are many attempts to define a metallic elements, and uh, there is usually not a clear distinction between the metallic and the non-metallic elements, of course, but there are some characteristics that the metallic elements have in common that may help distinguish them from other groups of other uh, from other groups of uh, chemical elements. Some I funnily tell you that a metal is any com any any element that conducts electricity. You're right, but is a kind of, a, a, there is a hasty generalization there because there is a non-metal that conducts electricity. So I might tell you metals are solids at room temperature. You are just describing the properties, not that this is just a clear. So today is gonna to be the introductory class to this. Now, what I defined first, I just said, what is a metallic element? Initially, I told you there are many attempts to try to define a metallic element. So I tell you there are elements that conduct electricity. I told you the weakness. So I will tell you they are solids. There are some other of them that are not solids, but they are still metals. So in that aspect, I gave you a definition which says that metals are elements. These are elements whose atoms ionize by the loss of electrons. So the hallmark is the loss of electron here, which means you can use this acronym to define a metallic element. You use this acronym, M-I-L-E, which is called MILE. This acronym can help you get the meaning of a metal. MILE means, M means metal, Metals ionize. I is for ionize. L is for loss, and uh, E is for electrons. So metals ionize by loss of electrons. So one can summarily say that metals are mild. Metals are mild. These are one of the reasons why you join this class to learn these shortcuts and this funny way of learning with the easy world of science. Don't forget to subscribe if you have not subscribed, and don't forget to share this video and also book for your own private classes to know the cheats and easy way to learn some things that you're finding difficult. So I said, when you say mild, you have covered the definition of a metal, meaning metals ionize by loss of electron or electrons. And that renders metals naturally reducing agents because they donate electrons since their form of ionization is by loss of electron. So having considered the definition of metallic element, let us take a look at the general physical properties of metals. The physical properties of metals, what are the general physical properties of metals? Remember to ask your question there in the comment box for those of you that are live watching, of course. Uh, now we have the properties, physical properties of metals. One can easily say the easier one, which we all know, metals are actually, they are good conductors of heat and electricity. Metals, are uh, good conductors of heat and electricity, of course. So they conduct electricity. What makes it possible for metals to conduct electricity? You're welcome back. You're welcome back. 
sorry for the little distraction. I say that electricity means the flow of electrons. So the electron flow in that brings about the conduction of electricity. So now what makes metals uh, conduct electricity? I say because of the availability of the mobile electrons that moves. Then the electrical conductivity of metal, you know that most metals we know, all the metals actually conduct electricity, but their, the degree of their conductivity is not the it's not equal, of course. The most conductive metal, the best metal that conducts electricity should be actually, uh, you have your silver, of course. Silver is the metal with the highest electrical conductivity. Some of those metals, uh, copper, aluminum, follows, then the magnesium, beryllium, the gold also have good electrical conductivity, but such elements like lead, titanium, mercury, they have a poor conducting ability. What do you say, Sir Majesty, please? When are you performing an experiment on the mixture of sodium carbonates and the, uh, okay, uh, that should follow up. You chat me to know that date, please. Our topic today is metals and their compounds. So don't deviate from what we are discussing. For the for some of you still writing their work and for your practical guide, I'll still fix a class. Uh, either a live stream it might be public or private but just keep in touch with this channel you will get the time i will do that all right so thank you for tuning in to my live stream so i'm trying to discuss the degree of conductivity of the metals of course the degree of conductivity of the metals we have said that silver is the most so you can use the acronym and i told you the least conductive ones the mercury the so-called lead titanium they are they have low electrical conductivity. but silver gold mercury have a high electrical conductivity now what i want you to understand now is there is an acronym you can just use uh, to know the the arrangement of the you can say uh, psycho gold aluminium or psycho gold aluminium psycho gold aluminium become Sico gold, eh? aluminium, become magnesium remembers sodium. You cannot have iridium. You just see the little acronym. For you to know the arrangement in the de uh, decreasing order of the conductivity of metals, the order of conductivity of metals, order of conductivity of metals. I say you can use the acronym uh psycho gold psycho gold aluminium or psycho gold aluminium psycho gold aluminium become magnesium remembers uh, sodium iridium you can now get zinc after so why this one stands for silver not actually use this don't you say silicon this is silver so after silver the next is copper then after copper, gold follows. I'm talking about the decreasing order of conductivity. The most conductive metal is silver, followed by copper. Then after copper, you have your gold. Then after gold, you have aluminum. But aluminum is the one that is cheap and affordable. The cheapest among these, because silver is expensive, of course. Nobody, nobody can afford this, using it for high cable wiring. So it is economically not wise, but of course, by efficiency, it is the best. But unfortunately, the cost implication makes it not usable. Then aluminum is the available one. So high cables use this. Then uh, after that, you have beryllium, calcium, magnesium, rhodium, rhodium and then sodium, you can have the iridium here. Then remember lead, uh, lead have low electrical conductivity. So we have mentioned number one, physical property of metal. We say they are good conductors of heat and electricity. And I've also discussed the, 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 the order of their conductivity. You can just say psycho gold aluminum become magnesium, remember sodium. Psycho gold, that's psycho gold aluminum become magnesium remembers uh, sodium that's the decrease the decrease in their electrical conductivity now another property of the physical property of metals is that uh, metals have characteristic luster they show characteristic luster meaning they have shiny reflective surface they show characteristic luster, meaning they have shiny reflective surface. You can spell E-R or R-E, depending on if you're using British or uh, American. So their surfaces are shiny and that makes them good for, you can use them to make uh, some uh, 
jewelries, of course. So the shiny surface and the highly reflective nature, that's what we call luster. Then almost all the metals have silver appearance, except copper and gold. Other metals have this silver surface appearance, but when grinded in powder form, they usually take gray or black form. So that is it then. Metals also, metals, uh, you, you can say metals are malleable. Yeah, they are malleable. They are malleable, meaning they can be hammered into sheets. Malleability of metals shows that the conformation of metals are not too hard, though they have strong metallic bond. You are from Ghana and I like your teaching. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. But this, your name is too long. I can't pronounce it, but thank you for joining the live stream. I just hold on and ask your questions when necessary. I say that metals are malleable, meaning they can be hammered into sheets. And the malleability of the metal shows that though metals are hard, they are hard but not break through, meaning they can be changed into one shape. So malleability means can be hammered into sheets. And that's why you can have sheets of metal from rods, from the, the metallurgy. Metallurgy is actually the art and science of production of metals, of course. So they can convert metals to sheets because of the malleability. Then, okay. Thank you, Ghanaians. Uh, so much love, you guys. Thank you, too. Thank you, too. Okay. Then, I think the other one I answer, Sylvester. Uh, Sylvester. Oh, that's that's great. You share the same name. <laughs> great of you. Now, we said the Amali, but I said they can be hammered into sheet. I've just finished that one. Then, number four is that... Uh, uh, my student engineer so, who's supposed to be reading these comments for me is not around so that's why i'm a bit distracted by the comment as i'm discussing i'm also watching your comments so sorry for the distraction the next thing is that they are ductile metals are ductile meaning they can be drawn into wires so malleability and ductility of metal shows they can be changed their shape can be changed then another thing is that metals have high density of course they are highly dense they have high density, but not break through. They are hard, but not break through, meaning they are not, they cannot easily be broken, but they are, of course, hard. And uh, because of the fact they are malleable and ductile, that makes them not break through. Then another thing about metals is that metals have high, relatively high melting point and uh, high boiling points. This is it for metals. Then metals usually form alloys, of course. So they have high melting point and high boiling point then what is the reason why they acquire this high melting point and high boiling points one is because of the metallic bond that is created to hold them together so the, the there is a strong metallic bond holding them together and I remember that the 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 bond energies in the metallic bond depends on the number of outermost share present on uh, the uh, on each atom of course and then remember that when we say they have high boiling point and high melting point, it's not all for the whole metals. And most metals are actually solids at room temperature. So I've discussed the physical properties. I might run them again. They have they are good conductors of heat and electricity. They have characteristic luster. They are malleable. They are ductile. They also have high uh, melting point and high boiling point. Metals also are solids at room temperature. But now, let me show you little deviations from all these conditions. There are deviations from these situations or these properties I've just mentioned now. For example, we say that metals are conductors. Yes, there are non-metals that also conduct electricity. Good example is carbon. Carbon in form of graphite conducts electricity. Imagine that. And you should also know that uh, the conductivity of metals generally it, it depends on uh, mainly two factors, temperature and impurity, of course. So uh, it, 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 the higher the temperature, the, the, the lower the conductivity of metals. And uh, also the, the, the more the impurity in a metal, the lower the conductivity. So if you want to enhance on the conductivity of metals, you should make them pure. But I've told you a deviation whereby a sub, a, an element that is not a metal conducts, graphite. Imagine that. Then we said that metals are solids at room temperature. What about mercury? Mercury is a metal, but is actually a liquid at room temperature. So that makes this no longer correct for all the metals. Not every metal have all these uh, properties that we just mentioned. Then we also say that metals have high melting and high boiling 
point. I just said it now. But some metals like cesium, cesium, which is actually the most reactive metallic element uh, in the S block in group one, can be your body temperature can melt cesium. That means the, 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 the melting point of cesium is below 40 degrees Celsius. Then if you come to sodium, sodium, which is also in group one, the, the, the alkali, uh, the S block metals, the alkali metals and the alkali S metals, they don't quite show this uh, high melting point and high boiling point, all of them. And they are not hard, they are soft. But we say that metals are hard, but not brittle. But when we talk about the S block elements, like the sodium, the potassium, the cesium, they are not all that hard. And again, their boiling points and their melting points, melting points actually, is relatively low to compare to that that's supposed to be found in normal metal. For example, I say that uh, cesium melts below 40 degrees, then uh, potassium have a melting point of uh, actually 63 degrees Celsius, then sodium also melts at 97. This is quite relatively low for metallic elements. So, and that, rhymes with what I said in the beginning of this class, that all the attempts to try to describe metallic element, trying to distinguish them from non-metal, there is always a, a, a coincidence or an overlap that avoids clear cut between metal and non-metal. But the best is that definition that I gave. I think I have done justice to the physical properties of metals, and I have also told you the limitations. There are some non-metals that have this property, but that one is a special case. Then let us take a look at the chemical properties of metals. What are the chemical properties of uh, metals? So the chemical properties, somebody say, please, with the density of mercury, uh, is mercury is still a metal and it has a high density, of course. Yes, the density can prove is, uh, is uh, the density is, I think, about 13 point something. Uh, gram per cm cube, but due to the melting point, uh, is liquid at room temperature. Imagine very low for metals, but it is it is still highly dense, just like metals. Okay, uh, bring your questions. I'll handle them, please. I'm focused on the screen and I'm looking at your questions live and direct. In case if you are just joining us, this is Sir Majesty's World Science Channel, and I'm taking you live on metals and their compounds i'm doing the introduction in case if you need more of these classes i'm giving to you you can actually get me on whatsapp with the number plus two three four seven zero six five one six 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 five one six six two one seven uh, you chat me on WhatsApp if you want to join and get your uh, private live stream, of course. That's plus 2347065166217. You get me there for further learning, especially in chemistry, biology, medical related courses. Then I have special hands in physics, mathematics, of course. Please spread the light. I cannot do without you. Much love from me to you. Remember, I can't go anywhere without you spreading the light. There are two ways to spread the light in this life. It is either you are the candle producing the light or you are the mirror spread, uh, uh, reflecting it. Reflect me wherever you are. Now, back to business. I want to focus on the chemical properties of metals. So metals are better discussed when we take a look at their chemical properties because some of their physical properties intermingle with that of some non-metallic elements, of course. Then... Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, if you should inform your colleagues, Sylvester, I appreciate you. Okay, let's take a look at the chemical properties of metals. First of all, we will look at the pattern of ionization of metals, which gave them that definition, of course, which gave them that definition. So we are into the chemical property errors. So number one is their pattern of ionization. Pattern of ionization. Pattern of their ionization. So metals ionize. They ionize by, they ionize by the loss of, the loss of an uh, electron or electrons. So this gave them their definition. So if you have an, a chemical element X, and for this X to form an ion, that it will lose an electron to become X plus, you know that X is a metallic element. And in writing this 
half cell equation. This E is for electron. Here has been zero. When it loses one, it increases by one. Such that if you have X minus two E, this is zero, it will now give us X two plus. So in this case, this is the general way metals ionize. Taking sodium here, sodium will lose one of its, uh, the, only lone, uh, the only electron in the outermost shell to become oxidized to sodium ion. And hence, if sodium behaves this way, sodium is a metal. And I told you earlier, the little deviation from this is hydrogen can also behave like this to become hydrogen plus, but hydrogen is not a metal. It has a dual nature. It can behave as a metal and also behave as non-metal, but naturally hydrogen is a non-metal. Okay, so the, the, the pattern of the ionization, we say metals ionize by the loss of electron or electrons. Then the second chemical property is the, are they reducing agents or are they oxidizing agents? So let us take a look at number two is that they are, they are the nature in their redox reaction Metals are actually reducing agents. That's what they are by the nature. The property of number one describes and qualifies number two, since they are ionized by loss of electron, which means they donate electrons. That means that makes metals, metallic atoms, potential donors of electron. And in chemistry, if you can donate electron, if you donate electron, it, that makes you a perfect reducing agent. But in the process of donating the electron, you yourself is oxidized. But the species that receives the electron you donate is reduced. That means as you, as metals ionize, they cause a reduction of something else, probably non-metals, of course, that will gain the electron. They themselves will be oxidized. Okay, so naturally metals are reducing agents, and I've explained that why, due to the nature of their ionization. Then next chemical property is actually, so what I mean, I can write an equation here. If you say sodium plus chlorine here, to give you sodium chloride, balance the equation. This is sodium chloride. There should be two here. Here. In this case, remember the charge here is automatically going to be plus one. Each one here has minus one, but because it's two, we are looking at minus two minus one chlorine is minus one, but due to it's two, that becomes minus two. But then this one should also be plus two. So in this case, sodium donated the electrons to become oxidized to sodium plus, while this chlorine now accepted the electron donated to this to become this. So you can say in this equation that sodium has been oxidized to sodium chloride or you say that chlorine has been reduced, so sodium chloride. What reduced chlorine? Sodium. What oxidized sodium? Chlorine. That means if metals are reducing agents, automatically it shows that non-metals are also oxidizing agents. The most powerful oxidizing agent we have is fluorine, and it's also the most reactive, and that makes it also, uh, because it, it can accept electrons, it's an opposite of metal. So that makes metal actually reducing agents. And because of the nature of one and two, that makes metals, metals are electropositive, of course. Metals are electropositive, meaning they form positively charged ion because of their excess proton over electron after losing electron. You know why we put those charges? We put those charges because when electrons are lost, it leaves the atom with excess proton, like sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons. Then when it ionizes to lose one electron, it now have one excess proton over electron. And that's that plus one we add. But when it is calcium, when calcium normally, it has 20 uh, electrons and 20 protons. But when it loses two electrons, it will now have 20 plus, that's 20 proton and 18 minus. So if you say 20 minus 18, it will give you automatically plus two. And that's why calcium ion has that plus. And that makes metallic ion positive. They are all electro positive. Okay. Then another chemical property of metals is the nature of their oxides. The nature of their oxides, of course, the nature of their oxides, that is they form mainly metals form mainly basic oxides. Metals form mainly 
basic oxides. The nature of their oxides, I hope my, you can still get the board, okay? That's clear. The, the nature of the oxide, they form mainly, why I say form mainly basic oxides, meaning what is a basic oxide? Any metallic oxide can be potentially called a basic oxide. They are oxides that are actually in the presence of an acid form, salt and water. And uh, again, is it possible for, uh, 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 for, okay, I like that question. Is it possible for a metal to gain electron? No, it is practically impossible because they don't have the high electron affinity. Remember, electron affinity is also an energy, just like ionization energy. So metals cannot, cannot gain electrons. It cannot. You trying to force an electron into a metal might dislodge any electron, leading to either promotion or excitation, which might lead to emission or something like that. You know, that is the mechanism in a tungsten, use of tungsten targets in the X-ray. You, you, you displace the inner electron such that the lower one goes down. So practically it's not easy to add or for, uh, for a metal to gain, it's not possible. So metallic elements don't gain. I think I've answered your question. So back to what I'm saying that basic oxides are actually oxides of metals. They are metallic oxides. And in the presence of acid, they form salt and water, or most of them, they react with water to form a base or form an alkalis itself. So that is the nature of their oxide. Then some metals, some few metals are actually form, the, some few metals are actually form amphoteric oxides, like uh, the so-called aluminium, lead, thin, and zinc. Their oxides have dual nature. Remember, amphoteric, the, the word ampho in science means dual, double. Even when you use it in biology, it is the same thing. Like in biology, you use amphi, amphibian, meaning having dual life, living on land and coming on water. And that reminds me, our uh, live stream tomorrow should be on biology. You make yourself available. The same channel, same time, 3 p.m., GMT plus one. You join me again in biology. Okay, then amphoteric means, an, uh, an amphoteric oxide means oxide that have both basic and also acidic properties. So the oxides of aluminum, lead, zinc, and also tin has the property of having the basic and acidic property. Then apart from a metal, what is very sure is that Metals, if not amphoteric, can never, can never, if metals, if the oxides of metal is not basic, is not amphoteric, it cannot just be ordinary acidic. No, there is no metallic oxide that is just acidic only. It can be amphoteric, meaning having both basic and acidic properties. So that is it for then. Non metallic oxides are either acidic, non neutral. Like, do you know that water is an oxide, H2O? Remember, oxides are compounds of uh, oxygen and one other element. So water is a neutral oxide and is a non-metallic oxide. CO2 is also an acidic oxide because carbon is non-metal. Then if you talk about NO2, so these ones, non-metallic oxides are either acidic or neutral. As you can see, neutral ones, the water, the laughing gas, then uh, nitrogen, two oxides, these are all neutral. But other oxides of non-metal, like SO2, are actually acidic. Unlike metallic oxides, they are basic, which means that if, they, if you see them in an equation, they are going to act as a base. If you see calcium oxide, with H2SO4, it will automatically, although the reaction might not proceed because of the protective nature, or maybe, you, you, you let me, yeah, no problem about that. We we'll use the same H2SO4 to give us CaSO4 plus uh, H2O. And by so, this is a salt, this is a water, which means calcium oxide here is acting as nothing but a base because this is already a known acid. So these are the properties. Then the next chemical property of metallic elements, you have a, their displacement reaction, that's the reaction with, uh, uh, with acids, that's their displacement reaction, the ability to displace hydrogen from dilute acids. Metals above hydrogen in the activity series of metal, so, uh, yeah, metals above hydrogen in the activity series of metal displaces hydrogen gas from dilute acids. It's one of the chemical properties of metallic elements, of course. So metallic elements, reactive ones above hydrogen displaces 
hydrogen from dilute acids. So in that case, we need to remind ourselves of the activity series of metal. And the activity series, the simple one that might help you to answer some questions, you can start with potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium. Uh, of course, after aluminium, we have uh, the, uh, the zinc, ion, tin, lead, hydrogen, copper, mercury, silver, gold. So these, uh, I've just run them down, but let me put it down. Uh, I'm going to put down the activity series of metal because it's very necessary in the next step we'll take after these chemical properties. Okay, so we have the activity series series of metals okay i say you start with potassium sodium calcium magnesium aluminium zinc ion tin lead hydrogen which is not a matter, it's not a matter, it's just to, then we have copper, mercury, silver, and gold. There are other metals, of course, but I'm going to use this list here to help you understand our classes today. I hope they are all visible now on the camera. So these are the, uh, this is the activity series of metal. So this hydrogen is just a determinant. All these metals here, they will all displace hydrogen from any dilute acid. But these ones below cannot, of course. So you have, if you have such reaction like uh, the common one, zinc plus HCl, the zinc will automatically take the position of this hydrogen to give you zinc two chloride plus hydrogen gas. Balance the equation we should put two here and that uh, makes the equation balanced. But if you say copper plus HCl, if you write something like this, plus this, this is incorrect. This is in, this is not visible. It's not practically obtainable. So copper is below and cannot displace. Like uh, if you are a if you are a trained child, you cannot tell your father to stand up for you to sit down. So uh, 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 the hydrogen is a father over copper, unlike zinc, which is a father over hydrogen. See the arrangement here. So. All the metals above hydrogen displaces hydrogen from dilute acid. Any dilute acid, though aluminium against HNO3, it will not liberate hydrogen gas. Uh, HNO3 is the only acid that might tend to deviate from this displacement reaction. Why? Because HNO3, that's the nitric acid, is a more of a oxidizing agent than giving acidic property. It oxidizes the liberated hydrogen to oxygen. So. Uh, that's the only acid that might tend to deviate from this fact. Then, for the activity series, you can use the acronym uh, for you to get the activity series over your, uh, in your head. That's why the live stream is here for you. Uh, for this activity series, you know, I call it without looking potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminum, zinc, iron, tin, lead, copper, mercury, silver, gold. So, if you want to get it in your head without forgetting it, you can use this acronym, Posokama Z, to learn how come Majesty sings glamour. Posokama Z, you just say, Posoka. So if you write it together, it becomes poso, posoka mazi. You see it? Posoka mazi, meaning potassium is for po, so is sodium, ka is calcium, so potassium, sodium, calcium. M here, magnesium. A here, aluminium. Z here means zinc, iron. That's I here means iron. So when, when you say posoka mazi, you have gotten to this level. So Posokama as it takes you here, then to continue, say Posokama as is a statement to learn how come majesty sings gloriously or glamour, whichever, let's say gloriously, glory, Gloriously. This is an acronym. That doesn't mean I sing gloriously, please. <laughs> Although I'm a chorister, of course. But this is the acronym. Poso Kamazi, you just use this acronym. Poso Kamazi to learn how come Majesty sings gloriously. That's potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium, zinc, iron, tin, lead, hydrogen, copper, mercury, silver, gold. So I think it's sounding in your head very well. Poso Kamazi to learn how come Majesty sings gloriously. Oh God, please remember to subscribe and share this video, of course. 
is a, 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 is your duty to spread the good thing. I'm very glad I have I stumbled or you stumbled on my channel today. For you that is just finding this channel for the first time, there are more good stuffs for you. Remember, I also supply laboratory equipments. I also equip your laboratory starting from the foundation, build it in a more functional way because I also do research and do these productions. And uh, I am now asking you to patronize and also support. You can check me up at easyworldscience.com. That's my website, easyworldscience.com and make your order or you can order with the number plus 234-7065-166-217 plus 234-65-166-217. That's my WhatsApp number, or you can even call, but you better WhatsApp. Or you can indicate in the comment box here for your laboratory equipment. Anyway, uh, you can reach you. And also, if you need someone that will help you in qualitative analysis, in quality control, the production advisor in chemical industry, Sir Majesty here is available. So you spread the light, please. Of course, I cannot do without you. Much love from me to you. We have tackled actually the chemical and the physical properties of metals. For those that are joining us, I will rerun the class again. First, we define metal as a, 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 any chemical elements whose atoms are ionized by the laws of electrons, of course. And using the acronym MILE, M I L E, meaning metals ionized by laws of electron. M, metal, I, ionized, L, loss, E, means electrons. Then we discussed about the, the physical properties. We said they are good conductors. We explained why they are good conductors of heat and uh, electricity. Uh, we also said they have luster nature, that they have shiny and reflective and a very high bright surface. And uh, uh, that's why I gave you the colors that almost all the metals have silver color, silvery in color, except that of copper and gold, which, uh, which are actually a bit brownish and uh, gold in. <laughs> I'm explaining the color of gold using gold in, of course, because we all know there is a color we call gold in. Then uh, we also say the, the metals have high melting point and high boiling point. They are high, they have high density. They are not brittle, they are hard, but unfortunately we have soft metals such as the S-block metals, the alkali metals are soft, sodium, potassium, cesium, they are regarded as soft metals, they are deviations. Then we discussed other things about it, just I believe you are following through. So, uh, and we stepped into the chemical properties, we say the ionization, the nature of them as reducing, they are reducing agents. We also say that they displace hydrogen, that's the last one, from dilute acid, from metals above the activity series, and they are naturally reducing agents. Okay, now, and I gave you an acronym to master this, uh, uh, the activity series. Now, let us see the ways metals occur. It is obvious this activity series is very necessary. Metals, because of their reactivity nature, they don't just occur freely. Not all these metals occur freely. I hope you can still see the board very well. Not all these metals occur freely in the Earth's crust. Because of their reactivity, they are very reactive, such that on seeing any other element like oxygen, they will combine. So you cannot say my country, just like you know that people boast, we mine gold, uh, this country is known for gold production. Ghana, of course, and some other country, they produce uh, gold. But you cannot say my country produces potassium and sodium because you can't mine them. They don't occur as free metals. And that will make me divide these metals here into three. We have the first one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Starting from potassium to aluminium, we regard them as very reactive i'm discussing the occurrence of metals of course then from zinc down to lead are actually moderately reactive they are moderately reactive and then these ones are very much least reactive and it might interest you to know that these are not the only metals we have among uh, uh, about 118 elements or more we have in the periodic table, about 95 or 75 or so, about 75 of them are actually metallic elements. 
and uh, it will still occur after discussing this i will discuss the occur it's still part of the occurrence so these very highly reactive metals and moderately reactive they don't occur freely in nature they usually occur in form of combined natural form where they have some impurities or some elements chemically combined to them and this form they occur are called their or o r e so the ores they occur in the natural ways where we can find potassium sodium but we call them the metallic ores so the ores occur naturally in deposits whereby you now use some processes to extract these metals from their ores now most of their ores occur in form of oxides some occur in form of trioxocarbonates some also occur in form of chlorides as sea salt some are actually rock salts the carbonates the nitrates the sulfates so these are the common ways and each of these metals have their own ore sodium sodium chloride is the ore of course then the potassium you also have the potassium chloride then we also have the uh, the calcium you talk about the the limestone the gypsum uh, of course then we also want to talk about magnesium i think you have the dolomite the limonite uh, so and the uh, aluminium you have the bauxite then zinc we have the zinc blend the the also the so the so-called uh, calamine uh, the calamine is also an ore of zinc the zinc sulfide so uh, we talk about iron. Iron, of course, occur in form of hematite. We have uh, also limonite as one of the ores of iron. That's the ores of these common elements. Uh, we have tin stone or lodestone, uh, lead. Uh, I think uh, gelina. You can see lead in form of gelina. And uh, copper. We have the malachite green, copper pyrite. So uh, the tin is also. We have uh, cassiterite. Is also an ore of tin, which is that lodestone. So. It's good you know all these things. We have also, uh, I have mentioned the uh, epsom salts, which is for magnesium. So you should master all these ores of uh, some of these elements. So the ores occur in this form. So having mentioned the way they occur, but these ones below can be seen as free metals, meaning copper, mercury, silver, and gold can be mined as free metals. From the uh, from the earth crust, only what you need to do is to purify them. It's no longer that you are carrying out a heavy chemical process to separate the chemically combined elements from them. Rather, what you do is just to do what purify them. So one can boast that we mine mercury, we mine gold, we mine silver. So your job, they can occur freely in nature, but not so freely and uh, shiny as you may expect them. Humans will turn them to the form they want, but they are not other reactive, so they can be mined as free metals. Now, in the extraction, uh, before the extraction, let me now tell you the distribution of metals in the periodic table. You know, the periodic table descript, uh, by description have uh, uh, actually eight main groups and 10 transition groups, which totals up to 18 groups in the periodic table with seven periods, of course. Then there are four blocks in the periodic table, the S block, the P block, the D block and the F block. It is quite interesting to let you know that among these four blocks, metals occupies the S block. Metals are also the D block. The metals are also in the F block. It is only in the P block that you have the combination of metals and non-metals and metalloids. Meaning in all these four blocks, metals are found in all of them. So the S, P, D, F blocks all have metals, but the the least block with the metallic elements are actually the P block. We have few P block elements. They include the aluminium, uh, the, the, the indium, thallium, the polonium. Of course, they are among the, the P block elements. I'm just trying to remember them. Yes, of course, aluminium, indium, thallium, lead, tin. Yeah, the lead, tin, aluminium, indium, thallium, polonium. They are all the uh, P block metals. So that makes metal the most abundant. They are more abundant than the non metals, of course, in terms of their number and diversi diversity. Okay. And uh, it occurs that even if when you come to the earth crust, of course, we know oxygen, which is non metal, is the most abundant, followed by silicon, which is still non metal. But the next one should be aluminium, iron. So you see that metals also uh, actually occupy a reasonable percent of the earth crust is that clear okay so i've made mention of it if you come to the periodic table i want to give a, a illustration of it there is a bar like this there's another bar this way there's another bar this way this is how 
Then we have another bar here. So here I have two groups. This is the S. Then this is P. There is six. One, two, one, two, three, four. And you can divide them into six, of course. Then this one is divided into 10. So this is S, P, D, and F. So these ones here actually are metals. All the S block elements are metals except hydrogen. And that's why in some authorities, they are just placed in the middle because they are not actually metals. But any other element in this S block actually seen as metal, we have them. Removing hydrogen, we have a, a lithium, sodium, a potassium, then rhodium, then we have a cesium and actually francium. So all of them are actually metals, but they are soft metal. Then if you come here, all the elements in the D block are metals. All those of them here in the F have this metallic property. So it is here that we have non-metals. And that makes the non-metal the lower one in terms of a number. We have finished discussing occurrence, telling you that the reactive metals or coin combined form known as ores. And I mentioned the ores of common or uh, common elements we have here. Then what is next? Let us look at the methods of extraction of metals from their ores. Methods of extraction of metal from their ore. So our next subheading, methods of extraction of metals from their ores. Remember to book for a private class with Sir Majesty. You will not find science so difficult again with me. Okay, it is the work of God, and I still thank God for that, and I pray he'll use me more to bring light to the world. Who am I without you? Now, the methods of extraction of metal, or the method applied in the extraction of metal, mainly depends on the nature of the ore or the reactivity of the metal in question. But before the metal is extracted from the ore, we should divide the extractive because anything, immediately you get the ore, anything you do to the ore in order to get the metal is extraction. We call such process extraction. So in the extraction, we have first the ore dressing and the main extraction itself. Dressing the ore in what I call beneficiation. So I might uh, divide the extract extractive stages of meta into two main stages, which are one, beneficiation, that is ore dressing, and two, the smelting or the main extraction. So I can divide these stages of extraction by first, we have what we call beneficiation. That's B-E-N-E-F-I-C-I-A-T-I-O-N, beneficiation, or one can call it all dressing. And the extraction itself, which might be generally called smelting. So the smelting is the main extraction itself. Most ores need to be treated. So all treatments, we want to focus on beneficiation first. Now, what is beneficiation? Any treatment given to ore to increase the economic value or to concentrate the ore prior to the main smelting or prior to the main electrolysis. So treating an ore to remove impurities, undesired impurities that might interfere with the main extractive method is what we call ore dressing or beneficiation. So in beneficiation, the main aim is first to remove impurity and prepare the ore to maximize the highest extraction of the metal from the ore. And the beneficiation depends on the nature of the ore. So ore dressing, in ore dressing, you first of all need to concentrate the ore. So in beneficiation, we are looking at the methods for concentration. What are the methods that we need to concentrate ore? You can easily remove the impurity, wash off the impurity, use your discretion. If you should see the, the ore, Combined with earth impurity, you can remove with your hand washing.
is magnetic separation. I'm now discussing methods of concentrating or under beneficiation or under all dressing, of course. I said you can wash the impurity with water. Then again, you can use magnetic separation or use a magnetic separator in case of an ore that have a paramagnetic constituent which contains the main metal you need and the non-paramagnetic, that's the diamagnetic aspect. Remember, metals, most metals exhibit paramagnetism, which is an evidence to show the presence of unpaid electron, of course. Uh, when I will discuss uh, transition metals, you will now know the implication and the impact of the paired and unpaired electrons presence in uh, metallic elements. It affects their properties, of course. Now, in the odd dressing or the beneficiation, I say methods for concentration under the treatment of or one, you say you can wash off with impurity or use magnetic separation, uh, especially if you are using a hematite, uh, actually magnetite, that is, if you are trying to extract iron from magnetite, that is a hydrated form of uh, iron. Ion 2 di ion 3, of course, that's magnetite. It has the magnetic property. Then another common method used for generally most metallic ore is froth flotation. Froth flotation is just a, a method of separation that try to separate the hydrophobic components from the hydrophilic components. That's the water hating part of the ore and the water loving part of the ore. Here you are you are required to churn, that's to grind the ore into very tiny particles and mix it with air and actually with oil then you bubble air in bubbles of air which will now make the froth to float when the froth floats it can be skipped with the bubbles of air coming out so in that case that's float a froth will not contain earth impurities earthly impurities which has a high density will sink to the bottom so in the concentration of oil i said you need to wash with impurity wash the impurity with water, I mean, or you use magnetic separator or you use froth flotation. Froth flotation, that should be F-R-O-T-H, and uh, then you know your flotation spelling. So that's a process that requires the formation of froth. Then under this beneficiation, I've discussed a sub-stage in the beneficiation. One is concentration of all, increasing the economic value, and that's where I mentioned the three stages, wash with water, wash the earth impurity with water, then the next froth flotation and magnetic separation. Under this beneficiation, you can now have what you call roasting in the air. You can also carry out roasting in the air. So you are just, this is the preparatory stage before the main extraction, under metallic extraction, okay? So roasting in the air is advised if the ore is not in oxide form, you roast in the air. So roasting in the air is just heating the ore at a very high temperature in the presence of enough air or in the presence of enough oxygen to convert the ore to oxide. So roasting in the air is not done when the ore is already in oxide form. Like if you want to extract zinc, actually from calamine, calamine is cal uh, zinc triazocarbonate 4, you need to roast it in the air. You need to heat the carbonate to convert it. I mean, you need to heat the carbonate, of course, that's the zinc carbonate, to convert it to zinc oxide. And when the zinc oxide is now available, you can now put it down in the furnace where you use your smelting to do the proper conversions, of course. So under this beneficiation, you have concentration of all, Roasting in the air, and I say roasting in the air, roasting in the air means uh, heating to a very high temperature. I hope my camera can get it down there. Roasting in the air it involves uh, heating the oil to a very high temperature. To convert the oxide to I mean, to convert the ore to oxide. So these are the treatments that are necessary prior to smelting. Then what the smelting now actually involves the extractive, the, the main extractive processes. And under this smelting, I'm going to discuss the methods used to extract metals. Remember, under this extraction, I say that extractive processes, I divided it into two the beneficiation, and then the smelting itself. Now I've discussed the beneficiation. What's your question? Tomorrow I have live stream, of course. You try and join tomorrow. I said it here, same channel. By 3 p.m., we'll be discussing biology tomorrow. Either we discuss cell biology 
or we discuss uh, genetics or any other topic you, of your choice. But definitely 3 p.m. GMT plus one, Nigerian time, that's a West African time, 3 p.m. Biology comes on air here, free for all. And uh, try to tell your friends also to come on, come on board. We'll discuss that. Then for further learning, like I said, there are people that are under me, I'm training. Even if you're a producer, you're an industrialist, please, I need you. If you need more, teachings as long as uh, this particular chemistry biology medical related causes industrial productions are concerned you chat me with plus two three four seven zero six five one six six two one seven of course or you visit my site easywellscience.com mainly for your laboratory equipments please i do this and it is only you that i'm looking up to get me the, to the level I want, and uh, I really want to appreciate followers for helping me get to 10,000 subscribers. I wouldn't be here if not you. Please, let's do more in a majestic way. We are into the main methods for extraction of metals, but I'm trying to explain the, the steps I'm taking so that you don't get confused, of course. I told us in the extraction of metal, it can be divided into two stages, the odd dressing stage and the main extraction itself. And the main extraction is what you can call smelting. Then the odd dressing stage, you can call it beneficiation. Under beneficiation, I told you what it means. Any treatment given to an ore to increase the economic value, to, to ensure high extraction of the metal in order just to concentrate the ore, of course, to remove undesirable impurities that can be removed. Under that, we discuss the concentration methods we say washing with water magnetic separation then fraud flotation then another step in the dressing of oil is also roasting in the air you need to roast the oil in the air when it is not in an oxide form so that it can easily be reduced during the smelting process that's during the reduction process then in the smelting that's where i want to discuss now the methods of extraction itself that smelting methods what are the methods applied actually in in extraction of metals. All are all reduction. Are all, all the methods are reduction. All methods used to extract metals from their ore are actually reduction methods. No other method apart from reduction. Then we want to see the reduction methods apply. So we have three methods in the extraction, three reductive methods or three reduction methods in the extraction of metal. Number one is by electrolysis. Remember, electrolysis is a redox reaction, but the aspects that will give us the metal is nothing but reduction. So you can call it electrolytic reduction, electrolytic reduction, of course. So then the number two actually is the thermal through chemical reduction. Chemical reduction. You can also call it thermal and chemical reduction. Thermal and uh, uh, thermal because heating is needed. That's where a chemical reducing agent is applied. Then another reduction method is Reducing the ore with more reactive metals. Reduction with more reactive metals. Reduction with uh, more reactive uh, metals. So these are the three methods applied in the extraction of metals from their ore. Electrolytic reduction, chemical reduction, or you call it chemical and thermal reduction, then reduction with more reactive metals. So these are the three reductive methods that are applied in the extraction of metals from their ores, of course, which means all the metals that gives us metallic elements from their ores is a reduction process, never oxidation. Do you know why? Because in the ore, metals occur in form of their ions, and the ions is the oxidized form. And therefore, for you to get the metal, you need to reduce the ion back to the atom, meaning removing the charge, and it will gain the electron it has lost back to become a neutral atom, and you have extracted such metal, of course. Then, in electrolytic reduction, you use electrolysis, of course, 
The electrolytic reduction, you use electrolysis. Then, in chemical and thermal reduction, you use a known reducing agent such as coke or carbon, carbon two oxide. Uh, these are the common ones usually applied. The coke or carbon monoxide uh, is uh, actually used under this thermal and chemical reduction. Then, uh, this other one, the, the other method is, it depends on the ore in question. For those of them that uh, do transmutation of metals, it depends on if you see that this metal is more expensive and that's where chemistry gives you money. You can sacrifice aluminium if it can give you gold. Yes, of course. It, it means that this third one is a bit sacrificial because you are just twisting. You are just trying to convert one to oxide and bring one back. Like if you react uh, uh, aluminium with uh, aluminium powder with uh, aluminium uh, with ion three oxide imagine that so if you re react aluminium powder with ion three that's what we call uh, it, it, that's the mixture in termit yes termit welding of course it will give you ion you have extracted the ion from the oxide uh, is a kind of this process you have sacrificed the aluminium to get the ion but this one is not economical because I'm very I'm pretty sure that the uh, uh, aluminium is more expensive than iron. That's just by the way. So let us look at this arrangement and see which method is suitable. Starting from the activity series I gave to you, the activity series we have potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium, zinc, iron, thin, lead, hydrogen, copper, mercury, silver, and gold. Hydrogen is never a metal, but it's there just to determine. The first five, the first five. The first five, lest I forget, you can come with your questions. For those of you that are online, I want to give you the grace to hear from you. Okay? At least comment in the class if it is going well. If it is going well with you. And please don't uh, cover the lights. Uh, while coming next time, make sure you have a friend to come alongside with you next time so by sharing the link to your colleagues your fellow students your fellow teachers and if you are a teacher and you're finding practicals uh, analysis very difficult contact me i will help you out of course use the comment box i'm waiting for you if you have question or questions you come along before i continue Okay, God bless you. Thank you. I love you too. You like my class. I love you. Imagine that for being there. But it would be better if you come with a partner, at least four or five. Yes, of course. Because though the free class will not be on, it's just a three-day offer. Today being 28 August, 29 and uh, being 29 August, sorry, 29, 30, and 31st. So you make sure your friends are available in these ones that will be coming. Then there are more uploads that are available here on this channel. And remember. I am always on a live stream, but the question is, some live stream, you don't have access to them. So there are some paid packages for this channel. And uh, please remember that we spend a lot trying to serve you. You can also support us the much you can. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for your comments and thanks for your compliments. Let's continue. I say the first five, meaning potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, and aluminium, are all extracted by electrolytic reduction. The only method you can use to extract this conveniently in chemistry, that is, the first five is extracted by number one method, electrolytic reduction. Then zinc, iron, thin, and lead are either extracted by number two and number three. Copper, mercury, silver, and gold are mined freely. And now, don't be confused. Here. These ones are mined freely. They are mined freely, and then you cannot purify them using electrolysis. Not that you are extracting them using electrolysis. That's the so-called uh, copper, mercury, silver. Especially copper, you can purify the, the, the ore of copper or the mined copper by electrolysis whereby you are required to make the impure copper the the anode and the pure is the cathode of course to collect the pure from the impure sample that should be a different topic altogether now it means that you cannot do you know the reason why these first five are only extracted by electrolysis the reason is this 
the only way for you to reduce their oxide is by electrolysis. There is no reducing agent on earth that will reduce the oxide of potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium to their respective metals. But there are, if you react zinc oxide with carbon two oxide or coke, it will get you automatically zinc under high temperature. Of course, that is the smelting process. A iron, iron, iron three oxide under furnace automatically gives you nothing but iron. So there are chemicals that will reduce this one. Automatic, that's what we call chemical reduction. That is use of powerful reducing agents, but there is no reducing agent that will reduce these ones. Then these ones are not too reactive, which means they can only be found with some impurities that can be removed or be separated by physical process and not chemical process. Yeah? Thank you for giving the video thumbs up, some of you that are there online. Now, let me now ask questions to check your listening ability before I proceed. First, if you know why metals conduct electricity, you tell me, why do metals conduct electricity? Why do you say they are good conductors? Okay? Simple. They are good conductors because of immobile electrons then what is the why do some metals show paramagnetic property this is a test question i'll ask the easy ones and the difficult ones what is the properties of metal that makes them paramagnetic if you're there let me know properties of metals that makes them paramagnetic are you there and then what can you say? Why is sodium actually not so hard? Why is it a soft metal? Then why is sodium, potassium, cesium have low melting point to compare to normal metallic elements? I'm waiting for your response. These few questions. Okay, now to wrap it up, we are coming to an end of this class, which means I've just taken this class to discuss the metals, the introduction, the yeah, compounds, of course. What we're going to do is that we will handle the S block elements. First, we will start with sodium. But I guess I'll finish explaining these things. Now, before I skip, Try your ability if you can answer this question from the classes you have been following so far, because this is how I do it. In a majestic class, I teach, I test you and uh, check if you're actually participating, not just a ceremonial follower. No, I don't want that. Benefit from me. But that's the best way to store knowledge, because I say if I cannot change the world, I will raise the brains that will change the world. And you're one of the brains that will help me change the world. Which of the following... Which of the following, which of the following, don't mind my writing, is uh, horrible because we scientists, we do write fast. We have many things to write at, the, at a short period of time. Which of the following cannot be reduced? to each metal by the strongest reducing agent or to each metal by cook at any temperature. It cannot be reduced to each metal uh -huh. or easily reduced. We have A, calcium oxide. Okay, let's take zinc oxide. B, we have a Lead two or lead four oxide, or either let me take lead two oxide. Then we have aluminium oxide, and then we have uh, iron three oxide. So, test your ability here from that test question. You say which, which of the following? cannot be reduced to each metal by cook. Let me see your answer. Which of them cannot be reduced to each uh, metal 
by Cook. Which of them? Which of them? You that joined us newly, thank you. You're welcome. But we are almost uh, we are almost done. Uh huh. Can this be the answer? Remember, they say cannot. No one is coming on board. Come on board, please. Type your answer A, B, C, or D. Okay. No attempt. That just by the way. I believe that whoever that is watching will be able to answer. I'll give you the answer after this. Now, I, I, I've done the introduction to the methods of extraction. So, which means now it's time to move into those metals. I'm starting with the S block metals and then their compounds. Remember, the compounds of metals, metallic compounds, have a kind of relation to the metals that form them. Although the idea of chemical change holds that the properties of compounds are independent of the individual properties of the elements that makes them up. But there are some common properties of compounds that relate them to the elements that form them. For example, all the compounds of sodium are actually soluble in water. Maybe you might not, you have not had this before, but note it. Any compound of sodium dissolves in water. Sodium, potassium, those, they, they dissolve in water. Why? Because of the nature of the metals and the type of bond formed, their reactivity also. So I don't know if you have come across any insoluble compound uh, of uh, uh, salt of like the carbonate of sodium, uh, any salt, salt, not actually, let me not say compound, please, salts of sodium are actually highly soluble in water. So which means the, 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 the nature of their compounds can reflect the nature of the metals that form them. And now, when we take each of the metals, remember I've discussed, like I'm now saying we are going to the S block metals. So the S block metals are extracted either by electrolysis or by chemical or thermal reduction. That is using a powerful reducing agent to reduce their oxides to the respective metals. Now for sodium, uh, sodium is one of uh, the, is actually is is common of course but is highly reactive it's common to the extent that the salt we use for cooking our table salt contains sodium so sodium chloride in form of uh, rock salt or sea salt is the source of sodium metal then how do you extract sodium metal from the discussion i told you should be by electrolysis and what's the or sodium chloride so Sodium metal is extracted from fused sodium chloride by electrolysis using a special cell called down cell, down cell. Okay, we have tried for today. God bless you for being there. Our time is, uh, is almost there, please. Tomorrow, try to be online here at the same time, 3 p.m. GMT plus one. You'll see me live and bring your friends alongside. I'm not seeing any question. I'll wait a bit. If questions are not coming, I'll call it a day for this class. And remember to continue for this particular topic, you need to come direct message me and demand. That should be for another private class, of course. Yes, of course, we will continue that one in a separate and other topics. My number is plus 234-7065-162-17. If you are calling from Nigeria, no need of putting the plus 234. You just say 0706516217. Then that is it on WhatsApp. Remember to spread the light anywhere you are. Thank you for getting me to 10,000 subscribers. Please, we can do more in a majestic way. Anywhere you are, represent majesty. Sponsor anything. Sponsor us with a little thing you can do by at least buying your reagent from me, booking for your own private class is a way of supporting this science because I'm doing research and there are a lot of things I want to catch up with. Please, you are the source of this channel's expansion. Yeah, connect a friend that will connect a friend and build this science community. No questions, no comments. That makes today a wonderful day. Thank you for visiting my channel once again. Bye for now. See you tomorrow.